Welcome everybody to today's webinar, Using Bokashi in Community Composting, What, Why, How, and Who. Uh, today, uh, we're gonna focus on what Bokashi is, an overview of how it's made, uh, benefits of Bokashi to micro food scrap haulers and composters. Um, we're gonna start with um, the first presenter will be Shig uh, Matsukawa, who's gonna talk, give some technical background on Bokashi, a little bit of an overview, followed by three lessons from micro composters, uh, Benny Erez at Eco City Farms in Maryland, Vondra Thorben with Bokashi in New York City, and Meredith Danberg Ficarelli with Common Ground Compost, also in New York City. Um, this is one in a series of webinars oriented toward community composters, and ILSR is offering this on behalf of the wider community composting um, network. We've been very pleased to, um, to be a convener of the emerging cultivating community composting uh, movement. We've had national forums, workshops, we provide other resources um, and we've been doing webinars. If you are a community composter and you have not already joined our growing coalition, you can contact us at the email listed at the bottom of this slide, composting number four, community at ilsr.org. Um, next slide. Um, uh, we have a, a website with some resources on uh, for community composters and some of the links on this website. Next slide. Um, a list, I know it's hard to read this, it's small, but just wanted to let you know this is here at ilsr.org slash composting, how to join the coalition, uh, links to our forums and workshops, infographics and posters, uh, training, we have a visit videos, uh, our latest is what is community composting, and then of course this series of webinars. Uh, one thing I also want to let people know that we've just started in the last few months is some podcast focused on community composters. Um, this next slide shows uh, one of our most recent um, is Kat Nigro um, with Tilthy Rich and Compost Now in North Carolina talking about pedal powered um, composters and how they're supporting the local food movement. So check that one out, check out the others. And if you're interested in being featured, do let us know. Uh, we'll be doing more of these. Um, I am sad to share, um, next slide, Nick, that um, one of the uh, last webinars that we did, uh, go back one, um, uh, last um, June, uh, one of our webinars on successful rat prevention for community-scaled composting that we did, one of our featured speakers was David Buckle. Uh, next slide, uh, many of you uh, may have heard that he um, sacrificed his life just this last Saturday morning to protest uh, pollution. And uh, I did write a tribute on him and his um, pioneering work in community composting, uh, particularly in New York City at Red Hook Community Farm, but his work had implications for the wider uh, programs that have started out. And uh, he was a, a prominent civil rights attorney. So um, next slide, uh, just as a screenshot of the tribute I wrote on Saturday, websites there to him on his work. So I invite you to check that out. And, um, and we will be posting um, soon his uh, full letter um, that he wrote um, uh, to the community composting movement. So circle back to our website when you get a chance. Um, one of the things he did um, is he worked with me on uh, developing the principles of community composting, which is shown on this slide. And um, those principles, you know, I'm not going to read them, but, um, you know, he very much believed that the community should be engaged, empowered, and educated, and that part of the definition of community compost is since keeping those resources as local as possible, but engaging the community. And I think this focus today on Bokashi is, you know, is a great example of how you can do small-scale composting and engage the community and harness the power of nature to do that. So I'm very pleased that we're offering this webinar this week. So um, before we get started with SHIG, we just have a few polling questions as people are joining um, to get a sense of um, who's on the line and where you're from and what you know about Bokashi. So if you could participate, um, that would be great. So uh, I think these are kind of self-evident. What sector are you with? Government, nonprofit, business, community composting, 
Urban Farm Community Garden. Hopefully that's enough time. Can we show the results? Oh, okay. Pretty even. Of course, you could have selected more than one. Um, okay, next question. All right, where are you located today? East Coast, West Coast, Southwest, Midwest, and outside US. Okay, results. Mostly East Coast. Got to do some more work in the Midwest and Southwest. Okay, we'll work on that. So are you currently operating a community composting enterprise? Interested in starting one or none of the above other? Results. Okay, about one third are already operating an enterprise and 41% interest in starting one. All right, I think we have one more question on Bokashi. Nope, I was wrong about that. For current operators, sorry. If you are already operating, there was one third that were already operating a site, select one or more of the following. Are you a food scrap collector? Are you a for-profit, non-profit, composter, gardener? Results. Okay, 38% are food scrap collectors. 23% for-profit, 38% non-profit, and almost 70% of you are gardeners, when, uh, excuse me, composters and one-third gardeners. Good, I hope this is beneficial. Now I think the last question is about your knowledge on Bokashi, or have you ever tried Bokashi before? All right, let's see the results. Yes, 39%, no, 61%, interesting, okay. We'll be curious to hear if this, if for those of you already tried it, if you've learned something new today. All right, so let us get into our, start our uh, actual presentations. And as I mentioned, um, we are gonna be starting with Shig Matsukawa, Bokashi expert of recycled food waste. He's based in New York City, and he's been studying Bokashi since 1993 and has been training and providing workshops to a lot of uh, folks. And um, he's going to cover the uh, some of the background and the technical aspects of what Bokashi is and how to make it. So, Shig, welcome. Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, I'm gonna go over some of the basics of Bokashi composting, uh, the Bokashi method of recycling food waste. Um, so simply the Bokashi method is two steps. Uh, step one, ferment the food waste. Step two, add to soil. Um, originally Bokashi was not about food waste. It's originally a farming method. Um, call it fermentation farming, or Bokashi farming, uh, where organic matter, plant matter, post-harvest residue is fermented and returned back to the soil or fed to livestock. Um, uh, go to the fourth slide. Okay. Um, oh, back one slide. Uh, yeah, so call it fermentation farming or Bokashi farming, uh, where organic matter was fermented and returned back to the soil um, or fed to livestock. Uh, that practice still exists today. Uh, the farmers make silage. Uh, they ferment grasses from oats, wheat, barley uh, to feed, uh, to ferment and feed livestock. Uh, now, in Japan, Bokashi, uh, it means fermented organic matter, where same or similar microorganisms are uh, used in fermenting foods and beverages. 
Uh, so we're talking about lactic acid fermentation, yeast fermentation, uh, or the combination of the two, lactic yeast fermentation, examples of sourdough breads, uh, making kombucha, scoby, uh, that actually stands for symbiotic cultures of bacteria and yeast. And Bokashi falls under this kind of fermentation. So Bokashi is about fermenting instead of composting. Next. Uh, Bokashi is technically the opposite of composting, and this is specifically step one. Uh, so in step one, we think in terms of fermenting foods uh, where it preserves the food waste instead of breaking it down. So after step one, the food waste still looks like food waste. So the fermented food waste still looks like food waste. Uh, now composting is about the decomposition process. In Bokashi, it's, it's really a different microbial path to cycle organic matter. It could be as a standalone process where you ferment and then add to soil or integrate it with composting, ferment, then add to compost. Next. Uh, here, I just want to cover the different kinds of fermentation, uh, specifically on methane fermentation, uh, anaerobic digesting. Uh, unfortunately, they use the same language as in Bokashi, which is anaerobic fermentation, uh, but it relies on different microorganisms. With methane fermentation, in order to produce methane, you need methanogens, uh, that is methane producing microorganisms. We're talking about archaea, uh, not bacteria. Now, we've been fermenting foods and beverages since ancient times to feed our bodies. Farmers may have fermented plant crop waste in the past to feed their soil and plants and also animals. Uh, with Bokashi, I think in terms of we're fermenting food waste to feed the soil and plants. Next. Uh, what, what really is Bokashi? It's a Japanese term, it means fermented organic matter. Uh, not, not all Japanese may know it, it's mainly farmers. Uh, it's been around since maybe the mid 1700s. No one's quite really sure. They find it in historical writings. It may be more recent, uh, even older. Uh, possibly in most, if not all, past farming cultures throughout the world may have done some form of the Bokashi, although they may have used a different term. Uh, now in Japan, one way that Bokashi was made was where farmers would go out to some pristine area, collect different soils and moss, return it back to the farmland, mix it with their post-harvest residue, uh, cover with uh, say hay to make it uh, to give it an anaerobic condition after it's fermented then they would spread their uh, bokashi over their field this does three main things uh, returns and replenishes their uh, the microorganisms nutrients and organic matter content now with em effective microorganism uh, discovered by uh, Teru Higa he's a professor of horticulture in Japan uh, in 1982, uh, it made it easier to make bokashi. Next. So what is EM? EM stands for effective microorganisms. It's a combination of three groups of microbes, lactic acid bacteria, yeast, and phototrophic bacteria. Lactic acid is a big bacteria, the same ones that are found in yogurt, cheese, sauerkraut, yeast, uh, same ones in baking, brewing beer and wine. Phototrophic bacteria is found in soil and water. Uh, it's also found in worm casting. It's the key to phototrophic bacteria. It's that it's a natural detoxifier. Um, so uh, Higa discovered that by combining these three groups of microbes, uh, they function differently than when they are just among their own kind. They're found in almost uh, in many environments throughout the world, but they're not normally found together. Uh, Higa needed to refer to this grouping by a name, so he called them effective microorganisms or EM. And EM1 is the actual liquid containing these three groups of microbes. Next. Uh, you can download this. This is just a, uh, a list of the species of microbes that are found in EM1, where they're found uh, foods, mainly foods. Uh, and you can take a look at it later. Thanks. Next. Uh, on, these are just basics. I'm going to uh, skip this slide and the next slide. Okay, so Bokashi, this is a simple recipe. Uh, black shot molasses, EM1 in water, 
and you mix that into some organic material. Uh, we mainly use wheat bran. Uh, we mix it to about 30% moisture. Then we pack it airtight to ferment for about two weeks. After two weeks, it's then ready to use. This is specifically wheat bran bokashi. It can be used in various ways, but we use it to sprinkle onto food waste uh, to ferment the food waste. Next. This is just more details. You can see on the uh, left of step one, uh, the two things you need are tight buckets and bokashi on the right side of step two. Um, the fermented food waste can then be added to soil or compost, and you can see the various ways in which uh, that can be done. Next. Uh, so we can ferment all food waste, including meats, bones, anything we can't do is uh, compostable plastics, since they require high heat to break the bonds that keep them rigid. Um, in step two, the fermented food waste. Now, technically that's also bokashi, fermented organic matter, but in order to avoid confusion, we really refer to the bokashi as the, as the fermentation starter, the, the brand that we add to the food waste, untreated food waste to ferment it. Uh, and so in step two, we generally refer to it as fermented food waste or FFW, which is then added to soil as a soil amendment or as greens and composting. Next. Uh, again, think in terms of fermenting foods and beverages uh, in step one and step two, you can think more in terms of uh, composting. And step one, uh, other than that you're treating the food waste, uh, pre-treatment or pre-processing, uh, you're also culturing a batch of diverse microorganisms. Uh, and since we're doing all kinds of food waste, uh, we have a diverse source of nutrients. In step two, then you can think in, in, in terms of uh, the Bokashi, what you're really doing is uh, you're adding, uh, well, you're using it as a microbial inoculant uh, to add replenished nutrients and organic matter. Next. Uh, a couple more ways to think uh, between uh, Bokashi and composting. With Bokashi, uh, you're directly adding microorganisms. With composting, you're creating the condition to attract the microorganisms. In Bokashi, pathogens are dealt mainly with metabolites and pH. I'll explain the next slide. And in composting, pathogens are dealt with uh, uh, heat. Now here, I just want to cover the metabolites uh, produced by the microorganisms during fermentation. Uh, so the pH goes down to about 3.9, which is key because for, uh, below 4 point pathogens have a hard time surviving. Uh, you have a wider variety of enzymes because of the different food sources. Um, so, and, and the combination of microorganisms. Uh, so it can break down uh, a variety of hard materials, think lignin, fibers, cellulose, chitin, et cetera. So the combination is what makes it possible to ferment meats uh, and so forth. And Shig, uh, this is Brent, Brenda, I'm sorry to in, in, uh, interrupt in the middle of your presentation. If you could wrap up in the next minute, that would be great. Sure. Uh, next slide. So, um, so the purpose of Bokashi, I mentioned before, I think in terms of uh, adding microbes, nutrients, and organic matter either as a microbial inoculant, uh, the micro is as microbial inoculant or a fermentation starter, next. Uh, and these are different ways Bokashi is used as a soil amendment to bioremediate soil. Uh, but mainly we're talking about fermentation starter in, in Bokashi composting, next. Uh, and it, you can think of Bokashi as a different, different ways to use microbes in different areas. So we have Bokashi composting, but also Bokashi farming and so forth. Next. And this is just a, a photo uh, version of the step one and step two that's done in our community garden in New York City. Thank you. Thank you, Shig. And um, we will be taking uh, questions at the end in your uh, uh, webinar control panel. You should see um, at the bottom there, it says webcam questions, polls, chats, or questions. And so 
do it's not too early to start writing your questions in and uh, we'll take them at the end so while nick is uh i want to thank you nick to the uh technology person who's helping me run this so as nick's bringing up the next webinar let me introduce benny Ares, um with eco city farms in uh, silver spring maryland and uh, benny's been one of my mentors and trainers in composting for many years um and He's done some trainings for us in the D.C. area on Bokashi, as well as other aspects of uh, small-scale composting. And he is going to share some uh, uh, how he utilizes this fermentation process to store food scraps at Eco Farms uh, composting sites before he composts. So, Benny, take it away. Okay. I'm here. Everybody can hear me, I hope. Yep, you sound uh, good. Yes, good. So, um I'd like to first say a few words about EcoCity Farms. EcoCity Farm is actually two farms. Uh, there's an S. We have far one farm at uh, Blatensburg, where we have our vermicompost operation, and we have another farm at Edmonston, where we do a lot of other uh, growing. Uh, we are in an urban environment, so we have to be very careful about uh, using and doing compost. Uh, in the picture, you can see our hoop houses. So why do we need to comp why do we need to use Bukashi? That's uh, next slide. So Bukashi is a sure way to get uh, uh, some of the problems that composting is bringing to our urban environment. Uh, we use our Bukashi fermentation. Uh, to um, enhance our vermicompost operation. And uh, what it does for us is reduces the uh, unpleasant smell uh, from the food waste. You all know that food waste, when you put it together in, in a closed container, it's going to be really stinky. Uh, in an urban environment, it is a problem, especially if you are having a problem with all kinds of vermin. Next slide. So this is uh, what you see over here in this picture is uh, our uh, mid-size vermicompost operation. Uh, we have boxes and we feed them uh, by hand. Uh, we uh, feed about one to two inches of uh, either food waste, obviously uh, Bukashi food waste or uh, pre-composted uh, material uh, and so this is the way we are processing our our vermicompost next um, so we can to make things simple um, and to, under, to understand our system we I kind of divided it into uh, um, basic three uh, four uh, steps so the first step uh, is uh, making the active or activating the Bukashi or activating the, the EM. When you get the EM from the, from the uh, factory or you make it yourself, it's not activated. So you need to really activate it. Uh, then you could take the Bukashi and the, the activated ingredients and add it to uh, brewer's grain or to oats and you make your grain and your grain is now activated then you will inoculate your food waste and you will uh, process it through fermentation what we do at our farm is we also pre-compost in most cases and we uh, sometimes actually feed the uh, fermented food waste directly but in most cases we do a pre-compost we get it to 150 degrees and we kill the wheat seeds and we also kill the microbes that are not so pleasant to have e coli and the like next so let me go through the first step and the first step is uh activating the em by the way, we get the EM from uh, in a bottle from Therogenics. Uh, it's uh, we usually buy the uh, one gallon, 
uh, it costs about uh, $75, but it goes a long way. It, uh, you need to dilute it very much. So the first thing we would do, uh, these are the ingredients. You need a, a three quarter of a cup of, activate, of the uh, inoculant. Uh, you need molasses, three quarter of a cup. You need a bucket, I mean, a, a, um, a gallon uh, bottle to put it in. You need airlock. Uh, as you know, um, Bukashi is a fermenting. It's without air, so you need to lock the, uh, the system so you don't get air into it. We also need a little bit of hot water or a water that it's about 110 degrees or something like this to make the molasses more pliable. And obviously you need about uh, 10 cups of, of 15, I mean, 12 cups of water. You will need a pH meter or some way to measure the pH because pH indicate when the material has gone through its full fermentation. And obviously a measuring cup, next. And so here uh, is the majority of the ingredients and the material that you would need. Uh, I'll start with the airlock. So airlock system is basically a way for one no, way for one wave uh, valve. It's a one way valve from the bottle that allows the air to go out or the um, gases that the fermentation produces to leave, but no air it will go inside. So it is protected from being aerobic system. Uh, what I use is a uh, close to one gallon plastic bottle. Uh, molasses, I usually use only the uh, uh, organic molasses. That molasses does not have any uh, sulfur uh, and it's, uh, it's good to be used. And obviously the inoculant. Next. So you mix all, all of these ingredients together a, into the bottle. I start with the molasses and I add the, a little bit of hot water to it to make it more pliable. I pour it into the, uh, into the activated uh, bottle, which you see at the, at the background. And then I add the, uh, the EM and make sure that it's all mixed. Next. And I store it in a warm place for about two weeks, uh, once in a while checking for the pH. In this, uh, in this picture, you could see that uh, there's starting to form a white, uh, white dots or white uh, foam on top of the uh, bottles. Uh, which is a good indication. Um, the storage is really important uh, to, to keep it in a, in a room temperature. Next. And uh, about after two weeks, uh, I start measuring the uh, pH. Uh, I look for a pH that is lower than 3.8. And it should stay for in, in, that, uh, in that level for about five to seven days. Once it's stabilized, it could be as far as 3.5, uh, the material is ready to be used. Next. Okay, so that's uh, the step number one is basically activating your, uh, your uh, EM1 and it's ready for the next step, step number two, uh, making the Bukashi grain. So Bukashi grain is basically mixing the, the um, EM1, the activated EM1 with some form of uh, grain material. Uh, and again, what you will need is three quarter of a cup of activated EM, three quarter of a cup of molasses, uh, you will need a five gallon bucket. Uh, you need some water, a stick and measuring cup. Next. 
And what I want to say about here is this is the way we do it over at EcoCity Farms. It's not necessarily uh, will work at, for everybody, but this is the way we, uh, we are doing it right now. So a five gallon bucket is right there. We're mixing the, all the ingredients, uh, which uh, you take the EM, the activated EM, the molasses, and it's nice to add a little bit of warm water to the molasses again because it's really, really thick. And you will add it to the bucket. And next, what we do is we take a stick and in order to make sure that the solution is completely dissolved and everything is in, in one solution, we start to turn it and we make a whirlpool like uh like uh world like the water goes into the sink next and you could see that it makes swirls and we switch the swirls from one direction to the other to the next direction we go in, in both sides to make sure that everything is completely mixed into the solution next then we are ready to uh, mix it with the grain. And as you can see in this picture, we are quite a large facility. So we have lots and lots of food waste and lots and lots of grain. We get our grain from uh, the local uh, brewery uh, and it's stored in these uh, containers. Those are airtight containers. And we could mix now the uh, the liquid that we just made and pour it over the, uh, the grain uh, to the point where it's not soggy, but it is uh, moist. And uh, you can go to the next slide. So as I said, you, you uh, replace that container into a warm place again. Obviously, you're going to have to lock it up so that it is again in anaerobic condition. Uh, when fermentation starts, uh, you will see, you will start to see white uh, mold spots on top of your, your Bukashi grain. And that's actually very good. If you start to see green or black, uh mold something has gone wrong and either you had air coming in or you had it too much it was too moist and obviously that and also by the smell the smell is quite remarkable uh, it smells uh fruity or um the smell is nice smell basically if it smells uh, not so good that means something has gone pretty bad keep it in that condition for about two more weeks um and now your your uh, your grain is ready to be used next and here's an example of the uh white mold on top of the uh grain this is uh a, a brewery grains uh, directly from uh, the uh, brewery that we have next to us. We put it in those in the barrels and you can see the bottom of the barrel. Next. If you're going to make a small batch like you see here, we use a wheelbarrow and we use oat bran or wheat bran and we slowly uh, wet the uh, oats bran with the solution. Uh, next, make sure that you are covering everything. You're mixing it very well. You see the fellow that helped me was sticking his hands all the way to the bottom and making sure that everything gets to be uh, mixed with the solution. Next. The next step is to, uh, if you're doing a small batches, you have to put it in some kind of plastic container. Uh, one time we made a mistake and we put it into a 
uh, a paper bag and it did not work very well. Uh, so I recommend using a plastic bag and, and tightening it up very well at the top. Don't let any air to uh, penetrate into it. And again, you do the same thing. You would leave it for about two weeks and uh, then it's ready to be used. Next. Next slide, please. Once the, that's step three. Once the grain has been uh, completely uh, fermented and you can see the white spots on top, then you could mix it with your uh, food waste. And here we get food waste from a restaurant. And uh, as the guy that came with the bucket, he puts it into our, our barrel. We just sprinkle a little bit of uh, Bukashi grain, uh, fermented Bukashi grain on top of it, just to cover a little bit, Not you don't need a whole lot. Uh, and we will close it and wait about two weeks and then we'll have the next step. Before we close it, next, uh, next slide please. We make sure that there's no air in it. And I use a, a piece of wood just to smash it and take all the air spaces between the, the material just to make sure that there's, there's no air in it. When I do that, I fill up the bucket all the way to the top or the uh, barrel all the way to the top to make sure that there's no air whatsoever in, in this uh, ingredients. Next. After two weeks, this is what you get. Uh, as Shag said, the food waste remains food waste, but there's no more smell. Um, it does look like still like the banana peels, are still banana peels. As also as what he said earlier, this is not like compost where things are being completely decomposed and look different. And that's one of the differences between compost and bukashi. We need to do something else with it. Next slide. In this picture, you could see sometime you will get the same kind of white mold at the top of your bukashi uh, mix. And that's a good sign. And that's a good layer, uh, a good sign to see. Next. So our next step is to the pre -com to pre-composting and we use uh, a, a aerated uh, system. If you could see that there's a blower on the, on the left and we blow air into uh, a container. Uh, it runs every two hours for about 15 minutes by clock. And that way we don't have to turn the pile or the, this material very many times. Once in a while we do have to. But this is uh, the, the pre-composting system that we use. You don't have to use it necessarily. Uh, it's it's uh, optional. We sometimes feed the food directly to the worms uh, without pre-composting. But I prefer to do this so that we kill all our weed seeds and also kill all of our pathogens. Uh, we usually get the temperature to about 150 degrees, 153, sometimes 160, no more than 160 degrees in, in the pre-composting. Next. And then obviously we feed it to the worms. We feed about one or two inches of uh, either pre-compost or um, or uh, material that hasn't been pre-composted. And within a week, you will see that all of that uh, material uh, most likely will disappear and will become compost. Uh, this compost is very unique. It is rich. It is tremendously uh, important for our operation. We use it for various, uh, we use it for compost tea, 
Uh, we use it to, to use our in our seedling mix. And we also use it just to put on the ground. It is tremendously important. Next slide. And these are the workers that actually uh, do the job for us. And if you feed them right, you can have as many as in my hand. I just picked up a handful of them and this is what I saw in my hand, so many of these worms. And with this, I guess I, I end my presentation. Thank you, uh, Benny. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. perfect. Thank you. Um, so again, uh, we're going to take questions at the end, uh, type them up and keep them, keep submitting them. Um, as Nick is bringing up the next presentation, let me introduce Meredith Danberg Ficarelli. She's the operations director at uh, Common Ground Compost in New York City. They operate several programs, including a bike powered food scrap collection program that serves businesses and households in New York City. Um, and today she's going to share how Common Ground utilizes Bokashi as a pre-processing technique at their compost site, which is at the east side, uh, outside Community Garden. So um, all yours, Meredith. Great. Thanks, Brenda. Um, yeah. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, Shig and Benny, for um, setting all of that up. Uh, I actually just learned a lot, <laughs> shocker. Um, and thanks everyone for having me. Uh, please, next slide. So um, this is our garden. I took this picture yesterday. Our plum tree was in bloom, which is very exciting because we lost all the blooms last year and didn't get any plums due to a late frost. Um, I'll talk a little bit um, in further slides about the different composting operations that we have here, but. Essentially over to the left um, is kind of the storage container where the equipment for our bike powered compost collection program lives and all the way over to the right that bright red square um, is a community compost bin that uh, that I'll talk about. Uh, next slide please. So quick background common ground compost is a consulting company mainly based in New York City. Uh, we help set up composting recycling programs. And under the Common Ground Compost umbrella lives Reclaimed Organics, which is a bike-powered compost collection operation. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the consulting side of things, you know, we essentially will do anything um, that a business needs um, in order to, to set up a compost program. A lot of it is based in training education, um, building transparency and understanding of the waste stream. Um, and then you can see kind of in the background, that's Sam, he's riding our bike. We have a six foot trailer um, and we're getting an upgrade uh, thanks to the US Composting Council and a competition that we were in um, back in January. So very excited about that. Um, and we're just waiting on that equipment. And uh, next slide. So uh, again, to frame the conversation, uh, New York City just completed uh, another uh, waste characterization study. Um, and they found that 34% of the residential waste stream is potentially compostable. Uh, hu obviously, huge opportunity there. Um, and on the, on the commercial side, obviously, depending on the type of business, you could be talking about a similar ratio or closer to, you know, between 50 and 80% organic, um, you know, if you're looking at businesses. So uh, every solution that we can find is certainly something we should grab a hold of. Next slide, please. Uh, and in New York City, um, the trash situation is basically split down the middle between the Department of Sanitation picking up residential waste and um, private companies picking up private waste. And we're talking about around 21,000 tons per day of material. So again, pretty big opportunity for that large piece of the pie that's organic. Next slide. So getting into our program a bit, um, why do we pick up with bikes? Uh, Essentially, we're looking at building a model for, um, for a scaled collection service. Um, and the, the main element here is the fact that small businesses can't necessarily um, fit the size of containers that uh, commercial, um, commercial waste haulers use. So on the right, you see that 64-gallon tote. Um, the alternative is a five-gallon bucket, which you obviously saw images of in, in Benny's slides and in, in Shig's slides. Um, we pick up food scraps from businesses um, in these five gallon buckets. They actually fill up the buckets and then um, either bring them out to our bike or we walk into the business, 
we grab the bucket, we bring it outside, tip it into the bike, and then give the bucket back. Um, our garden does not have water year round, so we can't do a bucket swap like a lot of other community um, scale compost collection programs do. Um, nor can we really handle being a bucket logistics company. Um, so that works out well for us. We do end up using um, some certified compostable uh, liner bags, um, which is not preferred. We would rather everyone be bagless, um, you know, from the waste reduction and sort of um, resource reduction perspective, but uh, it just doesn't work for everyone. We do service some offices and some operations that just don't have the capacity to wash their own buckets. And in those cases, the bags are needed. Um, and because of that, we also partner with a commercial waste hauler. So we process some of the material that we collect in our community garden. And we also partner with a commercial hauler that picks up from us at our garden. And I'll talk about that in a second. But um, one of the major benefits to bike powered collection is that we can offer the scale of service that's needed for the smallest businesses in the city. So the small cafes, small restaurants um, that might not necessarily be able to be served by a larger scale operation. Next slide, please. So how we use Bokashi, getting into it. Sorry for um, so much background. Uh, essentially, um, in, in some of Shig's slides, you saw this, uh, this bin on the bottom right. Um, the brand is it's called a Barracuda bin, B-E-A-R-I-C-U-D-A, -I, I believe, and they're known to be bear-proof, um, which also, also means that rats can't get into them, uh, and they are airtight. Um, so that's kind of the standard piece of infrastructure in our program. Um, and over the last six months or so, we've also built a two-bin ASP system, which is the upper right image here, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, we built that with a lot of help from SHIG, so thanks a lot again. Um, we're based in a school garden, as I mentioned, and we have a memorandum of understanding with that school to use this space and to act as stewards of the space. So we operate our bike program, but we also have launched a community garden. Um, for the last two years, uh, the membership has been growing. It's, it's very exciting. And we also um, help either educate or lead educational programs for students both from the school and from other schools in the area. Um, and you know, I did a tour this week with a master composter course um, showing them our system. So generally, you know, helping to educate through our program. Um, we use coffee chaff for our Bokashi, which I'll show some pictures of. You've heard through these presentations about using um, oat bran, wheat bran, et cetera. Um, Shig has really helped us build our program um, and coffee chaff is what works for us because it's free and really available. It's a byproduct of the coffee roasting process. Um, and through the, through the next slides, I'll kind of show you a progression um, of how we use our system. Um, and I know I mentioned earlier that you know, our operation, while it started with us processing 100% of what we collected using the Bokashi method in our garden, that has evolved and now we have a ratio where some of it is processed on site and the remainder goes up to um, an industrial scale uh, compost site um, in upstate New York. Next slide, please. So um, this is from the outside of our garden. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see one of those compost totes. Uh, so we have those on our trailer. Um, and this is the container that gets picked up by our commercial hauler overnight. And then on the left, we actually have uh, an art installation slash compost box. You can see that it says New York compost on the front. Um, this is by an artist named Debbie Ullman. And uh, she, there are three of them currently throughout New York City. And we're about to, um, I think, roll out another one uh, kind of in the Soho area of Manhattan. Um, and if you pop to the next slide, I think I have an, another image. Yeah, so the bottom left corner, you can see that there's a padlock on it. Um, there's essentially an email address. People can email the email address and then they get a, a YouTube video that gives them instructions for how to compost using our, uh, our Bokashi method. Um, inside of that container, there's a five gallon bucket, uh, a little trowel, and uh, a tiny, a, a pitcher essentially that has um, dried uh, coffee chaff Bokashi in it. Um, and residents will watch the video. And once they email us back and say they've watched the video, they get the code. Um, and then they can use this drop-off box um, that's located outside of the garden. So if the garden is locked, they can obviously use it 24-7. And our compost program 
services this box, opening it up every day or every other day to check the level of food scraps in the five gallon bucket. And when it's full, uh, we will either just seal it off to ferment and then um, you know, we'll trench it ourselves or we'll empty it into a larger bin and replace that bucket so that it, keep, it can keep getting used. Uh, and on the right hand side, this is just a larger version of the same thing. Uh, because the garden isn't open 24 seven, our community members don't always have access and that's what the yellow bin is for. But the red bin, um, you can see on the left hand side with the yellow lid, that's a bear bin. Um, and it's, you know, it's a 35 gallon, I believe, container that, that seals closed. And then on the right hand side with the white lid, that's our dried bokashi. Um, so residents can come unscrew that yellow lid, uh, you know, put their food scraps in the bin, chop it up a little bit with the shovel to sort of increase surface area, and then take a small handful of, of the bokashi and sprinkle it over. Um, because this bin gets filled sort of over the course of a week or a few weeks, um, it do, it's not anaerobic until the bin is full. And it, that once it's full, completely full, we'll seal it up and use a hand truck to wheel it over to another part of the garden where it sits to ferment until we're ready to trench it. Next slide, please. So um, in addition to that community composting process, we essentially use the same process for, process, for bokashiing um, the material that we pick up from food businesses. Uh, it's just kind of a nice example. Um, on this slide, you can see the upper left corner. Those are um, five gallon buckets with lids on them. And they you can't really read it that well, but it says fermenting bokashi started. Um, and it says, that's an old date. But anyway, um, these are two buckets of fermenting coffee chaff uh, that we have already added the EM and the molasses to. Um, we let them sit for two weeks. And then um, we, dry the, we dry that material in these tubs that you see on the bottom left, um, mixing daily to make sure that, you know, there aren't clumps and to make sure that things dry, that it dries evenly. Um, Benny mentioned challenges with mold. So one of the main things we want to do is make sure that this material stays properly aerated and can dry evenly um, so that it's kind of light and fluffy and ready for us to use um, rather than using uh, wet bokashi um, to add to our food scraps, we use uh, dried bokashi. Um, next slide, please. So in the early days, we were processing 100% of what we collected here in the garden. And about two years ago, these uh, our program invested in the lumber and time necessary to build these garden beds that you can see in this slide. But before that, um, this was kind of just an open space. And that's where our trenches were. Um, so, you know, we would go through the processing into a, a into the bear bins, which basically at the end of the bike haul every day or, or every other day, our haulers would um, open up a bear bin or, or, you know, use one that was half full, um, get a shovel and um, shovel a couple scoops of food scraps that we had just collected from businesses into the bear bin, um, chop, 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 and then add a handful of bokashi and keep going until the bear bins were full. Um, we would let them sit and ferment for usually between two and four weeks, kind of depends on the season, on the availability of our time um, and, and other things, you know, whether there was snow on the ground, et cetera. Um, and then we would uh, dig trenches in this area, usually one trench at a time. And the trenches could be um, you know, anywhere from two to three feet wide, four to six feet long, um, and around three feet deep, uh, our garden does have actually a, a plastic liner underneath, um, three to four feet down um, to separate it from what's underneath that. Uh, so we can't go much deeper than that. Um, and, then we, and then we would use a layering process, essentially layering some of the soil that we had removed um, along with some of the fermented food waste uh, and coffee, uh, coffee grinds, um, straight coffee grinds picked up from other businesses. Uh, which act as a rat deterrent from what I understand. Um, and then just making sure to cap it off with a solid 10 to 12 inches of soil. Um, and, you know, so it would basically be like a Bokashi lasagna underground. Um, and then with that, that nice cap on top. Um, and we, we basically just left it. Uh, depending on how well the material was chopped up and mixed, um, you know, weeks or months later, you could dig in and either it would look like, you know, healthy, dark soil with lots of worms, or you might find small clumps of um, what looked like fermented food waste. Uh, frequently, you know, you might find a clump of um, 
of like leafy green stems, um, things like, you know, asparagus or, or kale stems that, you know, didn't necessarily get incorporated properly or, or, you know, rinds of different um, citrus, that kind of thing. But for the most part, um, pretty well incorporated. Uh, and it, essentially we just did this direct soil remedi remediation activity in this space um, for a solid two plus years. Next slide, please. So we continue to process into, into bare bins. I mentioned kind of the, the layering process. And we are now working through uh, a more systemic process. Um, we're hoping to get an industrial scale grinder, so uh, which we haven't done yet. Um, and if anyone has any suggestions for something that's really durable and could live in the garden and be electric powered, please do let me know. Um, but essentially, rather than having our haulers get off of the bike after um, doing a heavy uh, haul load, and then processing into bare bins with a shovel or an ice chopper, um, you, you know, sprinkling bokashi, the idea is that they could batch load into a grinder um, set over a bare bin or another type of bin um, that could help to, uh, you know, shred essentially the, the food waste material along with bokashi um, and just improve the efficiency of the system. Um, what we're considering doing, and, and my logistics manager is going to be submitting this plan next week, so I'm very excited to see what the plan is, but we're looking at probably um, processing into bare bins throughout the course of a week. So by the end of the week, we would have between five and six full bare bins that can be set aside for fermentation. And then two to three weeks later, we would process those into our raised ASP bin system that I'll talk about in a second. Um, and that composting process, we'd flip that switch on. Um, like Benny said, it's a, it's an automated blower um, that's it's you know off for 90, 90 minutes or, or two hours and then on um, for a short period of time. Um, and and we're still working through what that uh, what that time frame would be. Um, but the, I, the the major benefit is that we'll be keeping this material completely separate from the ground soil. Um, our garden does have around two hundred parts per million of lead. Um, and we would very much like to be able to um, use this uh, future compost material either in our own garden operations, uh, the community garden, potentially sell some of it or give it to the school, et cetera. So we want to make sure that it's safe. Next slide, please. Um, this is a screenshot. I did not choose the colors of this spreadsheet, so <laughs> bear with me. But ah, bear bin, bear with me. <laughs> um, essentially showing the way that we track the dates of our um, of our bare bins. This is a screenshot from a while ago, but um, you get the idea. Essentially, when we started filling the bin, when we closed the bin, and then two weeks later when it's ready, um, and then looking at you know when it was buried and where it was buried so that we know not to retrench in the same location again, um, that, that sort of blue column of where it's buried will obviously change um, now that we're going to be trenching into a raised bin rather than into the ground. Next slide. Are we stuck here? Okay. Um, so this is our ASP bin system from behind. Uh, you can see there are two bins. That that black um, plastic container with the two bricks on it has the blower in it. Um, and those PVC pipes have holes in them. Um, the bottoms of the pipes have holes in them. Uh, next slide. So, um, you know, essentially you force air through the system, like Benny said, so you don't have to uh, turn it as often. Um, and again, I want to thank Shig for helping us construct this system. It is uh, as rat proof, I think, as a system like this can get. Next slide, please. So the ingredients that we use, um, we've only trenched uh, fully into one of these bins once so far. So we're still getting a hang of what our ingredients and process will be. Um, but we did about a four to six inch nest, if you will, at the bottom of the bin of um, leaf yard waste and wood chips uh, to help you know, act as um, sort of a biofilter, uh, you know, absorb liquid, absorb, uh, absorb moisture generally, um, and, and also obviously create some, some space for air. Um, and, then, and then we did a layering process uh, where we actually mixed um, the fermented food waste in a wheelbarrow first with some more wood chips and some other material, including coffee grinds, 
um, and, and would then add, shovel that mixed material um, into the ASP bin system and then layer again with some more wood chips and just repeat that um, until we got to the top, making sure that all the way around the edges of the, the system along you know, where you see the hardware cloth, um, rather than allowing any of the fermented food waste um, to sort of peek through the sides, uh, we would continue building up that nest around the edges of woody material, um, which certainly also helps to reduce odors. Um, Benny mentioned that the Bokashi process uh, does help with odors, but it, it still smells like fermented food waste. It's a very specific um, scent. And, um, you know, depending on your system, it can be more pungent uh, or depending on, you know, the season really. Um, so, you know, we like to try to cap that whenever possible because we are in such an incredibly dense um, neighborhood. Uh, next slide, please. Um, then what we will be doing likely is, is curing into this older three bin system that we have. Um, again, keeping things separate from the ground soil. And we'll be working with the New York City Urban Soils Institute to test the final products. Um, likely, we'll be sending multiple tests through over the next couple months to see, um, you know, what the material looks like. Uh, definitely looking also at kind of organic matter and all those fun things. Um, and we'll be building a bike rim trommel to help us sort this material and ideally bag it. Next slide. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meredith. Um, Okay, so we have one more speaker. I am so pleased to introduce uh, Vondra Thorben with Vokashi again in New York City. Uh, Vondra is going to share the value of pit and trench composting that she's using and how she's using fermented food scraps um, and, you know, take the yuck out of recycling food waste. So, um, uh, Vondra, all yours. Hello there. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also going to just say next. Nick, thanks very much for, for taking us to the next slide. So I'm delighted to be here today and um, just want to review some of the things that I'd like to go over. One is the natural growth in the last couple of years of, of Bokashi, which I think is terrific. My preference for EM1, share some of re recommendations of my service and the de development of our uh, composting methods and finally the need to really advocate more and more for bokashi as a, um, a way of handling food scraps next so if you just do a quick google of bokashi you'll see pages and pages of bokashi coming up which i think is a uh, really really important I have been, you know, beating the bush for Bokashi for a number of years, and I really um, want to see us, particularly in the uh, botanical world, in urban uh, composting, etc., really pay more attention to um, the work that we're all doing. Thanks. Next. So my preference, of course, is for EM1, um, which is the original uh, microbial inoculant. There are a number of other uh, inoculants that are coming onto the market. And then there is actually a natural uh, combination of microorganisms uh, referred to sometimes as indigenous microorganisms, which I've heard tell of. Um, next. And here is from um, EM Japan, EMRO with a wonderful cartoon of the many, many ways in which AM is applied and uh, from cleaning your car to, um, to watering your flowers. Next. So there are thousands of Bokashi stories um, and I just wanted to flip through some of the examples in Europe. Um, this is a wonderful uh, EM journal that's put out by a uh, Pitmal from uh, Bremen, Germany. And the, this is, a, it would be great to have this type of presence in, in America too. Next slide, please. And this man is very proud of his spinach, which he's grown with, uh, with his homemade EM. And you can see those spinaches. Look like uh, trees. Next. 
and then another example of people using the leachate actually creating a leachate from um, their bokashi next and finally use this example of using activated em which is what is being sprayed out of the uh, fire engine and it, it can be used for uh, handling um, molds and foulness and other pathogenic uh, germs. Next. So here's some uh, examples of some Bokashi from Kahika, Colombia. And um, next. Uh, have I, I think I've lost myself here. So um, in 19, I mean, in 2009, when I started uh, thinking about a co compost collection service, which I thought about because 500 people were taking, were walking their food scraps down to the market at Fort Green in, in Brooklyn. And I thought that surely some of those people would like to have somebody uh, chain, uh, you know, help uh, them manage their food scraps. However, I also knew I did not want to manage rotting food. So I had to find where else to go. And that's how I happened across Bokashi. Next. And um, the internet, so I didn't, was eager to start a business and to find a name. So I coined Vokashi, Vokashi the method and Vokashi the service. Um, but at that time in 2009 is when I met, um, I met up with Shig, uh, who certainly mentored me through the first uh, couple of years because it was, you know, we were all nervous about whether, you know, this method would really work in an urban environment. And indeed it does. Um, particularly the issue around trenching. Next. So over the last uh, eight or nine years, I have built up a, a business of uh, households. And um, I have one celebrity at the moment, Lucy Lou. Next. And um, some comments from uh, some of my business clients. And I have two anchor business clients. One is the EPA. And then I'm servicing a large commercial real estate uh, building where there are 150 offices. And in those 150 offices, many of them have our bucket so next and we're collecting from them once a week so um so that's our sort of front end service we provide the buckets we provide the brand and people just fill up the buckets some customers are going to be adding brand as they go along some are not we don't we don't worry that much about we're not sticklers about making sure that everybody adds the brand I really appreciate uh, Betty for showing us how we make the brand. I haven't showed that picture, but that's sort of how I make my brand too. Um, the and then once, um, either once a month or weekly, depending on the volume, uh, we come through and we collect. And next, we take your food scraps back to the earth uh, where they belong, as it were. So this is actually pretty much what the site look like, looks like uh, now, um, with less people and it's not as green. But um, next, um, we started much smaller and we have been essentially demonstrating two or three of the composting methods. And I call trench composting when it's a small little trench. 
then we uh, can use our fermented food waste to add to traditional methods of, of composting. And then what I'm d demonstrating now is pit composting. And pit composting re really is to go down seven, eight, 10 feet deep, 20 feet long and five feet wide. And then that a 10 foot deep pit can actually take between three and four tons of fermented food waste. And then we Mom, just so let that, mean, that Mom, food do waste. You mean 10 inches? Do you mean 10 feet? 10 feet. 10 feet, okay. Yes, deep, deep pits. And then really just let the worms do the work. Now we leave that pit for, you know, seven, eight months. We're not trying to um, uh, ex ex accelerate any of the composting. So we just leave it. Next, uh, next please. So here's the trench composting in small gardens, next. Then we went to a larger community garden where we were mixing our food waste uh, buckets with uh, the yard waste, next. And then we got this offer at the end of uh, December in uh, 2011 from Marine Park Golf Course. And they were looking for compost. I said, I didn't have any, but I would make them. I would make some for them. And they have actually been the place for us to really grow and experiment. So we experimented from more these little above ground trenches next um, and making all of these little wooden frames and using bags or whatever I was uh, top of mind <laughs> at that moment uh, to, uh, to process uh, the, the food scraps. In addition to which I was meeting with people at Brooklyn College. So a young uh, intern um, was interested in, in doing a little experiment. So we set up an experiment to see what the ratio of fermented food waste to soils or yard waste would be. So next, it was a sweet little um, uh, uh, project and the intern got an award which was lovely and a little bit of a prize so just to say how much uh, space there is for or potential there is for doing research using botakashi next so then for the next couple of years it's all about figuring out how to get from above ground composting to below ground and just going from trenches to trench to to digging deeper and this is where being at the golf course we have uh, the help of the backhoe there to dig a big trench um, and then we can just layer up our, uh, our food waste and then we put sawdust and food waste and sawdust next and once the uh, the food waste or the, the pit has sunk, has settled for a while, we'll then have that backhoe come in and he'll, he'll excavate it and he'll put it onto that pile on the left, the bottom left. That's a pile of the of food, of material that has come out of the pit. And then we'll sit there for probably another, uh, you know, six to eight weeks before we will sift it and then give that to um and, and give that to uh the golf course so all of the material that we uh, the compost we make goes to the golf course and is essentially used for their ornamental ornamental gardens next and the other nice thing about bokashi is that if you that if you um you you can uh, put it into a bucket and set it aside. So the other value of using Bokashi is that the material does not have to get um, does not have to get. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm fussing with a phone here. Ugh. Um, the
Next. So another little experiment that I wanted to do a couple of years ago was to uh, was around the leachate. So the leachate actually has a lot of valuable uh, nutrients in it. In and I, I observed that in these uh, composting and particularly above ground composting systems, what causes the smells is actually from the water and the water and the air. Is, is what, in my opinion, I don't know it for sure, but is creates the um, the odors. So what I wanted to do was to find out what was in the leachate. So an, another student uh, managed a research project was to empty the uh, fermented food waste into the white container, seal it, and then uh, uh, drain the leachate next. And we did this actually with the help of two or three other um, composting initiatives like the Lower East Side Ecology Center. And we got leachate from a restaurant um, that uses um, one of the industrial uh, composting machines. And um, it, there is a, it was a, it, an important exercise to, to, um, to take us next in, down the road of, um, of the, um, the importance of fertilizers and leachate as a fertilizer. And bearing in mind that, you know, the, the fertilizers that are on the market like uh, miracle Grow or Scott's, you know, these are huge billion dollar um, industries. So being able to sort of capture our leachate and to produce it for, um, for uh, in, in the case of the golf course, of course, it would be great to, to use that because they're spending thousands of dollars on their um, their uh, chemical fertilizers. So the results of this um, uh, exercise was really quite helpful in, in pointing us into that di direction. Next. And then that, so we do the lecture. The next uh, experiment we're part of is actually the, um, uh, the uh, a compost analysis um, and sample that was study that was done in 2015 um, and New York State DEC funded the Cornell Waste Management Institute uh, to take and test samples from 10 of the community compost sites in New York. So um, our compost got tested um uh at uh, the waste uh, uh, at Cornell Waste Management Institute and um the compost that we the, uh, the that they're taking there is actually sifted material that would have come out of the ground and had been sitting on the side for about uh, two two months before it was sifted and taken up to be tested next and these are the results of our site. And next is um, the results of all of the sites. And as you can see, this is, you know, a, a huge endeavor. Uh, but it's the sort of research that I personally think that we um, and as a business need to be doing um, regularly. And the uh, next, and which sort of leads me to my, you know, my final uh, comments, which are um, the need for popularizing um, uh, Bokashi. Uh, there are uh, many examples of Bokashi in Asia, in Europe, 
there are biologists who are working hard to identify and tag and mark uh, beneficial microorganisms for environmental uh, cleaning jobs. And um, we just need to collect more scientific data uh, to share with the botanical gardens and uh, the composting research community. And in fact, I want to say that in large part, I'd like to see the botanicals and the uh, other uh, institutes actually take this on um, to help us uh, lend more weight and validity to um, the process. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Vondra. Um, this is terrific. And uh, I think it's Murphy's Laws that if you're giving a, a presentation live, somebody will be trying to reach you incessantly on your phone. Um, <laughs> so um, right. we have... We have a lot of questions, and uh, Nick, while we're doing the questions, if you could do, we have some polling questions, so I think we can uh, do do uh, both at the same time. Just go ahead and run the poll. I'm not going to say anything. There's only four questions to get a sense of of um, what people learned uh, from this. Um, but uh, this webinar, we're going to go till 2.30 Eastern, another eight minutes. Um, we have a lot of questions, and so um, if all the speakers could unmute yourselves, and um, and uh, if you keep your answers very short, we'll get to more questions. So uh, first, um, uh, Vandra, um, uh, uh, there was a question about, just to start with you, is what your final product for the golf course look like, if you could just say that very briefly. It looks like regular compost. It, we sift all the material. And it looks like regular, like okay. regular compost. Yeah. Okay. Um, and there was um, um, uh, can, <laughs> this is another quick question. Can you eat fermented food waste? Um, no. No, I didn't think so. Okay. So whoever no, asked that, okay. very clear answer there. Um, and I know I said to run the poll, but I'm saying I, it's hard for me to actually look at the questions when the poll's running. So after this one question, let me ask, uh, after this poll, um, uh, let me, um, I, I, I didn't realize I couldn't do both. My apologies. Okay, I'm glad we struck the right balance there. So Nick, let me get to the questions and then we'll ask the last two poll questions when we can. Um, um, uh, so I know, uh, Meredith, you asked about the grinder. There was a question is, has anyone tried using an insincorator for grinding, like mounted on a lid for a five-gallon bucket? Maybe you don't necessarily need to answer that, but that was a comment. Um, and uh, Cheryl uh, Dixon asked, do all the presenters compost meat in their bokashi? And Benny, maybe you can start. Does EcoCity feed the fermented meat to the worms? Benny, why don't you start? Yeah, we don't use, we get our food waste from uh, a place called Compost Cab. They go through uh, the DC, they collect from private people and they are instructed not to give us any meat at this point, no meat. And we don't even get uh, compostable uh, bags or compostable um, uh, ware. So we are pure uh, vegetable uh, composting. I take okay. everything. I take everything. Okay, good. Yep. And Reclaimed Organics takes meat and dairy. Um, because of our partnership with our commercial waste hauler, we can also accept the certified compostable material, but we don't process any of that in our garden. But we do put meat and dairy into our Bokashi system. We pick up from one soup company, and if we get big stock bones, those will go to our commercial hauler instead of into our system. Okay. Um, uh, let's see, sorry, there's so many questions here. Um, how how long does one have to wait before they can plant seedlings in Bokashi? Um, I've always uh, depended on Shig as a resource for that. I don't know, but Shig, I, you want to take that? It's it's basically two weeks. Uh, 
under under certain in most conditions. So uh, the the fastest way you can do this, you take untreated food waste. Bokashi takes two weeks, and then bury it in the ground. And in I would say in most cases, uh, wait two weeks before you can plant your seed or seedlings. And we discover that certain plants you don't have to wait. Like uh, we we tried it with okra, and uh, the same day we buried the fermented food waste, we planted uh, uh, some okras and they did fine. While when we planted Swiss chard, it didn't do so well until after two weeks. Then when we planted some fresh Swiss chard, they did well. Mm -hmm. Good. Can, can I, I would like to hear, I think, maybe from all of you very briefly on the benefit of Bokashi to repel rodents, you know, rats in particular. I mean, it's... Uh, and you know, terrific to be able to feature common ground compost and Vokashi, you know, two operators that are obviously operating in urban areas with high rat pressure. Can you each speak to that? Sheg, do you want to start about the fermentation process? Sure. Um, so in our experience, uh, they don't like, rats do not like uh, fermented food waste, especially fresh fermented food waste once they're buried in the ground. and uh, over a period of time, we discovered that uh, if they have somewhere else to go, they'll stay away. And, but if they don't, if uh, uh, we have construction in the area, so they force the rat out, they'll come back after, say, about a week. Uh, so that's about the time where pretty much a significant amount of the fermented food waste has become part of the soil. Also, any kind of other microbial activity would have changed under uh, the uh, soil condition which it should be aerated. So uh, you have different functions among the microbes. Uh, and so it becomes part of the soil, which doesn't bother the rats either way. So there, at that point, if you have any leftover clumps, uh, the change in odor among those um, may attract rats. Uh, they may not necessarily eat them, but the, it might attract uh, uh, their curiosity. Um, otherwise, uh, it's, if you bury fresh from at the food waste, they tend to stay away. Uh, and if you really did a nice uh, thorough mixing of your fermented food waste in the soil, they'll break down much more quickly and evenly, and that should not attract the rats. Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to add to that based on your own personal experience? Well, I just want to say that generally speaking, because people are separating their food waste and putting them into buckets already, in your kitchen, you've made a huge difference. Um, and I just think in particularly in these big buildings that have huge rat problems, I haven't received actually my recommendation from the big building that I serve. But I know that they have that they have nowhere near the rat problem that they used to have. Because most of the food waste now is locked in uh, in buckets and they they there's no access to the food waste mm -hmm. yeah i second that it's about containing it more than anything but agreed with everything that, that bondra so one uh seems to be a, a a question that a few folks have been asking here is it best to add the bokashi to a compost first rather than direct application to the soil. And Benny, I'm gonna start with you because you don't add the Bokashi to the soil. Is there some reasoning behind your system and why you produce the compost? Well, I prefer to go and use compost. I'm, I'm dealing with vermicompost uh, and that's a sure way to feed uh, um, the uh, material. Uh, and safely so that I don't have, since I'm feeding at the top of these bins, it reduces the smell and it doesn't attract the, the vermins, uh, doesn't attract any, any rats. Um, I prefer also to uh, get the temperature in the pre-compost and reduce uh, that way, reduce weed seeds. Uh, it's not so much against uh, bacteria because the actual process of fermentation does take care of it, but it is the wheat seeds that I'm killing also. Mm -hmm. yes, Anybody I, else want to go ahead, Bonnie? I, I'll, just, I'll just speak to that because actually our um, 
when we have some above ground uh, sort of windrows, for example, we will have uh, all sorts of um, squash growing, tomatoes. I mean, should we wor worry about uh, seeds, which we don't actually, because we're not se selling our material to farms, um, we would have to we would have to include uh, an ASP system. Okay, so I know it's two thirty. If if people need to go, uh, please sign off. I'm just going to ask uh, one more question and then ask the presenters if they're willing to um, uh, to answer some of the questions we have sent in. You know, in the future, and we can post them because I think this would make a nice kind of FAQ on Bokashi. But uh, one, a couple of people asked about just doing it year round. Meredith, do you, uh, you know, how does the weather impact what you're doing? Meredith, are you muted? Vandra? Yes, I'm sorry, I was Oh, sorry, muted. go ahead, um, go ahead, Meredith. We, so we do go year round. Obviously, if the ground is frozen solid, we, we couldn't trench into the ground in the past. Now that we are gonna be trenching into a, a, an above ground system, um, it do, it's, doesn't make as much of a, of a, um, of a difference uh, what the weather is. Obviously, if we're outside and there's a snowstorm, it's a bit harder to um, do any kind of activity, but um, for the most part, uh, the weather really doesn't affect our operation um, unless the roads are dangerous and we are therefore not picking up um, for a day. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'd like quickly to add to it, uh, when you're making the activated EM uh, and also the, the grain, you got to put it in a room temperature. Uh, otherwise, if you're making your pre-compost or you're putting it on the ground, it's not a matter of a problem unless you can't dig. But uh, we use ASP system that gets hot anyway. So it's not a problem in the winter. Good. Um, so I'm going to ask the uh, last two questions. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, Nick, if you could put up the polling, polling the last two um, uh, just for those who we still have a number of people still on the line. Thank you. Um, so uh, one question was, will this webinar be available? Yes, it will. We'll post it on our website. You'll be able to share it from there. And then lastly, there was um, not the last question. There's there's many, but this last question I'll ask right now is, uh, is there a, can you put, uh, we know we can put meat in, uh, you, you know, use Bokashi to uh, handle meat. Um, and uh, bones and whatnot. Is there a difference in smell like week one versus, you know, week three? And Vandra, maybe you can start with um, with this since you do so much collection. Uh, well, I will have to say that um, households that there are households that are uh, have a bucket for six weeks, and they're not complaining about the smell. But they so the brand is sort of helping them. Um, but I would say that it, based on what I put into my bucket, if I'm putting nasty food into my bucket, it's going to smell nasty. So depending on my diet, and if I have a good diet, my bucket is going to be pretty good. That's another good point for buckets, <laughs> is it does help you sort of on your diet. Yeah. Um, uh, Meredith, do you have any comments on like the length of time in a bucket? And you may be muted again. And Nick, could I'm you go sorry. to the last question yeah. too? <laughs> Same thing, really. Um, I, I would lean on Shig actually for an answer about the smell related to meat or no meat. Um, I haven't personally experienced a difference. Um, uh -huh. I'm, not, I'm not really sure about that. Okay. Um, so any any closing remarks by anybody? Um, uh, we'll just with the, yeah, so with the smell, uh, it's all about how airtight the, the bucket is. And then aside from that is the amount of sugars to feed the microbes. If you have stinky food, you could kind of turn it around, uh, adding more bokashi. But they, if you know, uh, any sugary stuff, uh, um, sauces, salad dressing, those would feed the microbes, make it airtight, it should turn it around, make it smell sweet. Uh, one thing about uh, incinerators, 
I, someone did try that. It makes it very liquidy. Uh, in our garden, we're going to try to do, use a shredder instead of a grinder, uh, and we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. Good. Uh, Meredith? Just thank you, everyone, for, for being interested. Uh, I can't wait to hear about more operations that are trying out the Bokashi method. Excellent. Uh, Benny, anything you want to say? Yes. Uh, thanks for uh, listening. Uh, hopefully, you got something out of it. Yes. And Vondra? Just give you the yes, opportunity okay. to. Thank you very much for uh, the support, Brenda. You're and welcome. Dick, and uh, just think of us next year for your uh, at the composting council. Yeah. And I'll just say, Meredith, I heard you say a verb, bokashiing. So we will <laughs> help to popularize that new verb. So <laughs> uh, thank you for all your presenters. Thank you all who stayed on to the very end. Have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Brenda, do you see the uh, polls?